So today we are uh, going to be in Isaiah chapter 17 only. And that was not <coughs> my intent whatsoever. In fact, after last week's lesson where Dylan was talking about all these different cities in Moab, I was watching everybody pretty closely. Nobody fell asleep. Which is good. Which is good. Because <laughs> we, were, we were a little worried. Um, so, but I had talked to Dylan and I said, hey, let's just do a whole bunch of chapters at once. And he said, hey, you do what you want. I'm, I'm okay with that. And of course, this week we're only doing chapter 17. <laughs> it's mainly because I had no idea how much controversy was around it. Uh, and, and that's probably the reason I didn't know that is because I've been reading Isaiah and reading through it for years and taking this in context. So anyway, before we begin, we better pray. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would be with us now. Because we need your help in order to understand what it is that you're communicating. And all the more this particular chapter because of all the controversy that surrounds it. So Father, be with us now. Guide us into your truth. And really, Lord, help us to have a good discussion about it so that we can understand and all be on the same page so that we can avoid the pitfalls that there are. Lord, we love you and we trust this time to you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. Welcome, welcome. Uh oh. It goes through right through your head. Oh. No, you're fine, you're fine. It actually it goes through. Oh, okay, so I'll capture it. <laughs> He's just, just don't walk it. it. Yes. Hey, you know, I spag it down while I'm trapped up. Just tell me when to tilt. Okay, so before we begin, and because there's so much controversy surrounding this particular chapter and the next and the one after that, um, we want to understand context and the cruciality of context. Uh, why is context so important with prophecies? Yeah, of course, context is always so important. But uh, why with prophecies? You can read this cute little cartoon to kind of give you an idea as they say in Boston, an idea. Well, it helps you understand what, what it's really saying, right? I mean, the context, not, right. yes, because if not, you get all the really weird stuff, you know, <laughs> cross-referencing the book of Revelation with today's headlines. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Is she, anybody disagree with her? Alright, well, we're all on the same page. Yeah, there's a danger, okay? There is a danger that you may be reading into current events that you shouldn't be reading into what's in Scripture. Now, there's also a danger that you might miss something, right? But in order to really know for sure, you've got to study. And to study, is it's hard. It's difficult, okay? But it's rewarding. Because then you don't fall for some of the things that we're going to see today. So, I do love this. <laughs> of course, this cartoon really does set up 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 through 4, which uh, I've read in here before. This is talking about the end times. Know this, first of all, that in the last days, very clear it's saying last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. People tire of this kind of thing. They tire of the mistake that Harold Camping made where he said the world was going to end on May 21st, 2011. They tire of the 80s countdown to Armageddon and 88 reasons why it'll be in 88 and 89 reasons why it'll be in 89. And then the, the lesser known, 90 reasons why he will return in 1990. Right? I think there was a 91, but... People tire of that. And when they tire of that, they say, yeah, right. Because these people, they sound really good. They sound like they know what they're talking about. And they have good uh, television production, too. And that's attractive to the eye, right? And it's quick blurbs, which is attractive to our attention span. So uh, let's talk about, though, the background 
on Isaiah chapter 17. This, this verse is happening in a greater, or this chapter is happening in, in the greater context of the book and in, a, in another context of the section that we're in. The section that we're currently in is from Isaiah chapter 13 through 23, where it's a message to the nations, right? And so Dylan took us through Babylon, Philistia, and Moab, right? And then today I'm going to take you through Aram and Israel, because Israel is part of the nations that are receiving messages. Because if you recall, Israel and Judah are two separate countries. And in the north, Israel, all they have are wicked kings. For the most part, it seems like everybody in the northern kingdom of Israel doesn't follow God. They follow after fake gods, right? And so uh, northern Israel, or yeah, the north kingdom of Israel is in there. Uh, Ethiopia, Egypt, Egypt and Ethiopia, in case you didn't get enough the first time around. Edom, Arabia, uh, then a, a bit on Jerusalem and Tyre. So the, the difficulty with this section wears not so much at all with where we were before, uh, like chapter 7 through 12. It was all pretty clear. It was in 734 BC, around that area. Um, it's hard to date these. It's very hard to it's very hard to date some of them. The, the one from Moab was a little bit easier because we it, it gave a marker right at the end. What was it, three years? This will, this will happen in three years' time. Yeah. And what year was it? Putting you on that the particular one was given in the year of uh, his death, presumably 715, 718 to 715. 715, okay. So you can date Moab, but it's hard to date some of these other gals. I mean, Oh dear. <laughs> I've got a meme coming up later. Oh. I expect some laughter because we've never gotten a laughter out of any meme. Okay, so let's talk about the background. So the background of this chapter is that it takes place in the message to the nations, hard to date, okay? But I'm gonna attempt to date this because it, it has to do with things that we just read. I know it's been weeks since we've been over it, but really if you're reading the book of Isaiah, you just read these things. Uh, you know that there's a bad king that's over Judah. His name is Ahaz. I had a picture of him right here. He burned some of his children to other gods, to fake gods. Uh, unfortunately, he didn't do it to Hezekiah. <coughs> Hezekiah is his son. Hezekiah is a good one. So he's, he's as wicked as the kings of Israel. And he sacrificed his own sons in the fire. He sacrifices in the high places. He makes multiple idols to fake gods. And he brings a lack of restraint to people. You know, when you got a leader that lacks restraint, you got a people that lacks restraint. And the judgment of God, as he said, was to bring Israel and Aram together. Where do I have that map? I'll have the map later. It's really good to know where these, these places are. But Israel and Aram, or Syria, come together and they're attacking Judah and they're beating Judah up. And so in chapter 7, if you remember, Isaiah meets Ahaz, and he, he says, Ahaz, don't worry about these guys. God's going to take care of them. He's going to take care of them. And then he gives a whole story about uh, um, the message to the house of David, and he talks about the coming Messiah, which if you want to hear about all that, we at least have those videos up on, on YouTube. So uh, he's exceedingly wicked and rebellious. The judgment is that the Lord sends these two countries to attack him. And he's scared, though. He's scared that he's going to lose the whole country. All of Judah's shaking with fear. Hundreds of thousands have been killed. Judah's army has been decimated. Hundreds of thousands, like 150,000 people are taken captive, and they're being dragged into Israel. I mean, your, your country's done. And they think everything's done. Or 200,000 going to exile. Uh, but a prophet in Israel convinces him, convinces uh, Israel, King Pekah, to let them come back. And so they came back. But Judah's shaking with fear. Uh, and Aram and Israel were going to kill King Ahaz, and they were, who is a Davidic king from the line of David. They were going to kill Ahaz, and they were going to put their own king. I mean, this is, this is the thing that really got God angry, because... They were going against God's plan for the Davidic king to stay until the appropriate time. And as we all know, who is the ultimate king that comes from the line of David? Jesus, that's right. 
So little do these guys in the past know the thing that they're trying to assault is the salvation of the whole world. And God said, that's not going to stand. He said in Isaiah 7, their plan is not going to work out. And God said in chapter 8, I'm going to send Assyria on them. And Assyria is actually going to come on Judah too, up to their neck. Okay? But then God said, you know what though, I'm also going to destroy Assyria for what they did. God said, I'm going to destroy Aram, I'm going to destroy Israel, and I'm going to destroy Assyria. Alright, so keep that in mind. Uh, as we read these first three verses. So if you haven't already, turn in your Bible to Isaiah <laughs> chapter 17. And we will read verses 1 through 3 for the next 50 minutes. Just kidding. Oh. Okay, here we go. Verses 1 through 3. And I'm reading out of the New American Standard. It says, The oracle concerning Damascus. Behold, Damascus is about to be removed from being a city and will become a fallen ruin. The cities of Arar are forsaken. They will be for flocks to lie down in, and there will be no one to fright them. The fortified city will disappear from Ephraim, and sovereignty from Damascus, and the remnant of Aram, they will be like the glory of the sons of Israel, declares the Lord of hosts. Okay, now, uh, this is talking about things that took place in history. Uh, all the things that I was just telling you about from chapter 7 through uh, 10, at least, talking about what God's plan was and, and what these guys' plan was, Israel and Aram coming together to attack Judah, and then Assyria wiping them out, and then Syria coming to attack Judah, and then Assyria getting wiped out. All of these things happened. But Aram, which is uh, Damascus, is the capital city of the Arameans. So when you hear me say Aram, or the Arameans, or Syrians, it's all the same thing. It's a bit annoying, I think. Uh, but it just it depends on how people, who's referring to them. So what's Aram? The, hmm? What's the difference between Syria and Aram? Is mine it said Syria and we said Aram? Same, same, same thing. Same thing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, it's just different words, different different way to designate. It'd be like calling uh, modern day Israel Palestine or Israel. You know. One of the things we suffer from in our English translations is that the Latin Bible came first. So a lot of these regional names got Latinized and then were translated into English. So a lot of a lot of the forms we have are very different from the Hebrew and then if you get into a Bible translation where someone is really bent on getting close to the Bible name, the Hebrew name, you're going to see it one way. When you see someone else who's used to seeing it in a more Latinized English context, they'll do it the other way. So I mean, like mine says Syria as well. Oh, okay. But the yeah. term there, I think, is wrong. Names do change. Yeah. Don't they? And they do get <coughs> Latinized, right? All right. Or Greekized or Hebrewized. Yeah. Or even Aramaicized. All right. So Damascus was removed as a city in 732. What happened is uh, Tiglath Pileser III, who is the king of Assyria, he came and man, he devastated the whole country of Aram. All right, but he, he took them into captivity. The city and the nation were decimated. It was rebuilt, okay, but it wasn't destroyed forever, but it was decimated at that time. Uh, it says that Damascus is about to become a fallen ruin. Instead of a city of fallen ruin, okay? Instead of sovereignty, they're going to lose their sovereignty. What's sovereignty? Their kingship? Like... Control? Right. Yeah, the power. Who has the power? In America, we have our sovereignty here, and it's vested in our government. If it gets replaced tomorrow by Russia, then... Uh, America will have lost its sovereignty to Russia, right? Okay. That's not a prophecy, by the way. <laughs> it's a hypothetical example. All right. So in 732, though, this happened. And remember, Isaiah was prophesying to Ahaz that these events were going to happen soon. And it was around the year 734 BC that he was prophesying. So within two years. And that was the message that God gave him in Isaiah 7. He said, don't worry about these guys. I'm going to wipe them out. In short time, uh, before your your new son Maher Shalal Hashbat, if you remember that name, anybody anybody want to say it? 
Hashash bots. That sounds like a kid's show. Hashash bots. So okay, Maher Shalal Hashbaz was a sign that Judah didn't have to worry because the it was going to be quick to the booty, quick to the prey, right? Okay, and that's exactly what Assyria was. They came down and beat them a couple of years later. Uh, so nothing is written about Damascus and Assyrian records for 20 years after they defeated. It doesn't uh, come back until around seven, um, 20 years later, seven to ten or whatever. Or seven, actually, I think it was more than 20 years. I think I saw it was 702 BC. Remember, BC counts down. So does BCE. All right. Uh, Damascus, now here's, a, here's the thing that you're going to commonly see prophets do. They're going to use a part of something to stand for the whole. Okay? Uh, it would be, in, in this case, using the city of Damascus, which is one city of many, many cities in a large area that has 16 districts, okay, to think of it as 16 states um, or 16 governments that are in Aram, okay? So this one city, Damascus, is standing for the whole nation in this, in this particular area. Prophets do this often. In fact, we see it in verse 3. He does the same thing with northern Israel. He refers to them as one of the tribes of Israel, the most prominent tribe of Ephraim. Okay. All right, so we got problems. We got you mean got problems. Um, we got problems because there's different translations. And the different translations that we have in question today are what does it say in our modern English translation of the New American Standard versus what, what does it say in the Hebrew translation of Dead Sea Scrolls versus what does it say in the Septuagint, uh, which is the Greek version of the Old Testament. I, I'm sorry to bring this up. It's a bit um, scholastic in nature, but here goes. So the New American Standard, as I read, says the oracle concerning Damascus, behold, Damascus is about to be removed from being a city and will become a fallen ruin. The Dead Sea Scroll says the oracle of Damascus, behold, Damascus is changed from being a city to a ruined heap. And finally, the Septuagint says uh, the word against Damascus, behold, Damascus shall be taken away from among cities and shall become a ruin. Any major differences? Will versus is. Will versus is. Okay, will versus is. That's good. That's good. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure, and I'm not Dylan, and I'm sure that I'm not Dylan. <laughs> Damascus is about. It says Damascus is changed, right? Uh, Damascus shall be, okay? So we see maybe some Greek influence up here. Uh, versus the, the Hebrew, of course, um, you're looking at the Masoretic, aren't you? No, I'm just, <clears throat> what I'm seeing is in Hebrew you have two tenses, you have perfect and imperfect, and that's it. Problem is, either one of them can be translated either future, past, or present, just depending upon context. Oh, so, oh ah, slick. context. Slick. So like when you say will become, is changed, uh, shall become, that's a translator issue. That's not necessarily a text issue. Um, and it's not a big deal. No, it's really not. The, the, I mean, the point is still being made. It's, it's an oracle. It's talking about the yeah. future. If you go with is changed, you, you get into more of a mode of there is a definitive declaration being made that this is going to happen. It's already decided it is. It's, it is removed. Now, it may not be as of yet, but it's going to be for yeah. sure. So, I mean, that sort of tense thing, it, it, you know, that's a translation issue. That's not an actual Hebrew difference. So. The Hebrew that the Septuagint is using to translate it into Greek. So Greek's much more specific. You have like two different kinds of future tenses and then have tons of past tenses. You know, it's very specific, but Hebrew's a little more what they say, Wild West when it comes to translation. So shooting from the Yeah. Yeah, just like that. Oh boy. Wasn't that a song? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Alright, so the context. Does this imply, does this verse imply that Damascus will never be rebuilt? Well, it says the sheep will lay down in it. Really? In this verse? Doesn't it? Or is that the other one? Verse 2. Oh, Damascus is about to be removed from being a city and will become... the next verse. Oh, well, you jumped the verse. Verse context. Verse. 
Minus context. <coughs> okay, so does verse 1 imply that it will never be rebuilt? Yeah. Not in English. <laughs> <laughs> not in the English, not in the Greek, and not in the Hebrew. Because you got three here. Okay. Oh, look, London. Uh, God is always specific when he says a city will be remain will remain in ruins. Okay? And he's going to say that. I mean, how many times was Jerusalem destroyed? And how many times did God say, I'm going to destroy it? So just because he says, I'm going to destroy something, doesn't mean he's going to destroy it forever. Unless he says, it, it will remain or I will destroy it forever. <laughs> Okay. Which does, if we, you know, if we go back to our Babylonian. Yeah, the Babylon. Place, to this day, the city of Babylon is not inhabited. It's in ruins. Ruins. It's fun to look at on Google Earth. I, yeah. I wish I could have gone or go there and something. Not safe. And, and you know, that's another thing to consider. It is rarely in history safe to be in any of these nations. <laughs> Unless you're as a conqueror or as someone that is greatly feared, and then it's easy to get archaeological digs done and that sort of thing. Okay, but it's, it's rarely safe, so it makes it difficult. Fortunately, we had this thing called the 1800s, and a lot of stuff was taken out of there before ISIS could smash it or you know, blow it up or whatever it is. They'd be like, Dude. Now let's look at verse 2. Now things are going to get sticky, okay? I hate saying this word, and I've been saying it a lot lately, but here goes. The cities of our own are are forsaken. They will be for flocks to lie down. The cities, I'm sorry, the cities of Arar are forsaken. They will be for flocks to lie down in, and there will be no one to frighten them. That's the New American Standard. Dead Sea Scrolls. The cities of Arar are abandoned. They shall be for flocks, and they shall lie down and not be afraid. Septuagint. And uh, this is in parentheses, it's not there, but the context of the previous verse on the Septuagint was uh, Damascus shall be taken away from among cities, it shall become a ruin, abandoned forever, to be a fold and resting place for flocks, and there shall be none to go after them. You see a problem? So why is the question of the meaning of RR so important? In the Septuagint, in the Greek version, it says forever. Okay, so what, what's the what's the problem <laughs> if it's <laughs> if it's forever? How's Damascus doing right now? It's there. It's totally, totally there, right? Okay, so if Damascus is there now, and you're thinking in these terms then what are you waiting to have for to happen? <clears throat> that is to say, if it hasn't happened yet, <laughs> at some point in the future, it needs to be abandoned and totally destroyed, right? But look at how sticky this gets. Uh, most of the English translations are not going to have this forever thing. And uh, you see, you have a, a, a problem because we have cities, which is plural, and then here you have, where's the word cities go? Okay, then you have the word, that word, arar, which is not here. But then we have Hebrew here, which is in agreement, and then we have Greek here. So, I ain't Dylan, so I don't know the Hebrew. <laughs> Um, I really had to go on for that one. Facebook. <laughs> Facebook, yeah. Yeah, I was going to put the Dylan Hills that I found on Google. Oh, nice, yeah. <laughs> As if I'm the dorkiest one. <laughs> so that was the dorkiest <laughs> one. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but I didn't have to do that. I just went to you know. Oh, brings back memories. That was a great trip. <laughs> yeah. oh, fantastic. So I read a scholarly article that explained the Hebrew and the difficulties in this, this translation process. 
because the way that the Hebrew word itself is constructed, it looks like it might be forever and ever. Okay? But it also looks like it might be a proper name, like RR. Can anybody say that word? I can say Maher Shalal Hashbats. Am I saying Arar? Arroer. Arroer. Okay. You can do it that way. I don't know if that's right. So, but we see that the term that might be forever and ever is not the one that Isaiah likes to use. Isaiah likes to use the word Alam, which is not the same as Arar. All right? Okay, so here's the word for Arar, here's the word for forever and ever. You see that they're similar, at least you can look at it and visually see. Hey, look, Dylan, so that's the soul of Isaiah. Can you read that? No. There's okay, no so there's apparently, no, there's no point Dylan ain't Dylan either. So. No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, so... Uh, that's a, the, uh, you have to be the native speaker to actually read that. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's probably not even written in... Well, it's just, it's not dotted, so I can't... I don't know. It's not dotted, so... Yeah. All right, so uh, <laughs> the, the Septuagint translators took it to be forever and ever, and if you read the Greek in Septuagint, it's a, literally into the ages. Uh, and and they dropped the Hebrew word for cities. What is this picture? Well, that's big fat Greek, Greek wedding. wedding. Oh, okay. okay. Um, Greek. Greek. Uh, yeah. Wow. That's when she had the, uh, the blemish yeah. before the wedding. <laughs> Great movie. You haven't seen it. <laughs> Alright, so what if the Septuagint is right? Alright, if the Septuagint is right, Damascus is still a city today. And then they drop the word cities also. And since it is still a city, then the prophecy is yet to come. This is a picture of Damascus. Okay. Here's the big question. Does a future fulfillment fit the context? And this is the, the problem that you have to answer as we read through the rest of this chapter. Does the context of this verse need a future fulfillment. Okay. And it's going to hinge on the Septuagint. Kind of. Why is the Septuagint those letters all accents? That's the, uh, that's 70. LXS of X is 70. Dylan, take it away. <laughs> Was it so, 70 translators? Yeah, so the, the, the myth goes that the there myth. were 70 Hebrew translators who translated it into Greek so that the, the Greeks would have their own version. But one of the reasons why the Septuagint is so important is because we have no remaining copies of the Hebrew Bible in totality before 900 AD. Until? Until Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. Sea. And then we've got a copy of Isaiah that dates back to the century just before Jesus, but that's as far back as we've got. And that's just Isaiah. I think there's some other texts in there as well, but for Isaiah, that's oh, there's far, yeah, there's yeah, there's, a, tons, there's, I mean, there's a ton of other like sin paper, but scripturally, Isaiah. There's a lot of scripture to be yeah. yeah, Isaiah's big. Um, Isaiah, and what's cool is when they compared Isaiah from the century right before Jesus, the Dead Sea Scrolls, to the one from 900, they're almost identical. Cool. So you have good copyists. That's cool. But the problem is we have no more Hebrew text before that. But the Septuagint is older than that. So the Septuagint is quite possibly using a pretty reliable Hebrew edition to create the Greek version. So you kind of got to put it, the Hebrew script we have in hand against the Septuagint and say, okay, what's the Greek kind of reflect, what would the Hebrew text be based upon what we're seeing both from the Hebrew we have and the Greek we have. And that's why the Septuagint is so important as we begin to try to sort out, okay, which one should we default to? In this case, the Septuagint might be wrong, and in this case, it might be right over what we have. So yeah. it's, it, it's, it's a big player in the discussion about what, it, what text actually says. When was it written, the Septuagint? Second century? Yeah, second century ish. Yeah. At least 100 years before, yeah. Okay. But then, I don't know, you still have. I've been reading a lot about Dead Sea Scrolls. I'm sorry, I admit it. Yeah. Um, and then the Dead Sea Scrolls. They're, they're written over a few hundred years they have and what they found would have been really smart to have looked to see when the Isaiah one was written because they have records on it. But it was pretty close to the time of the Septuagint. I mean, it's not like it was hundreds of years. Okay, but since we have this issue, 
let us look at the context of what's going on for the rest of this chapter. Okay? Oh, yeah. Or no, let's look at the other option we have. The Aurora option. So, there's three cities that we see in the Bible in biblical times that have this name, Aurora. All right? There's one that's in Moab. Now, it's kind of cool because this verse, verse uh, 2, happens right after the thing about Moab. And it's near the Arnon River. I want to go see the Arnon River. It sounds very Tolkien-esque. Um, but it, it recurs shortly after that. So is verse 2 maybe looking back at Moab and making some sort of connection. Right? That's a possibility. Another aurora is a city in southern Judah. It's still around, actually. This, this aurora, I can't put it down. Um, but it has less to do with Aram than Moab. Uh, Moab is actually uh, south. You've you got Moab, Ammon, Aram. So if we're talking about, and Damascus is here, if we're talking about, hey, a roar <laughs> down here, it doesn't make a lot of sense. We're a roar down here in Judah. Um, and then there's a third aurora, which was in the territory of Gad, one of the tribes of Israel. And it was north. Actually, it wasn't too far from the Arameans at all. Uh, so it's a possibility that this refers to some cities in that, in that area in which Israel and Aram were using in order to stage their assault against uh, Judah. Possibly. Okay. So these are the city possibilities. Uh, on that, too. At one point, <coughs> Reuben has the Aroar in the north of Moab as well. So, you know, you may have a... Again, you remember when Moab was like from north to south, we got problems. Oh, yeah. And you may be getting the same thing there with, you know, you got, you're up a portion of the kingdom of Israel all the way down <coughs> to the southern portion of the kingdom of Israel as well. So, it's another option. And another one said that Ammon took it over as well. The yeah. Ammonites. Yeah. Who knows? Aurora's all over the place. But what do all of these cities have in common? They have people in them. That's true. They're all named Aurora. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Uh, so uh, it, it's interesting that there, and it's three different countries that are naming it all the same name. So what does that tell you about Aurora? Aurora? Aurora. Whatever. What does it tell you about that city? Yeah, it's a popular name. It's a name like Jeremy. Very popular. Lots of people that teach this class use that name. Other than that, there's not many. Okay. Alright, so here's one of my favorite things to look at and think about. Uh, and I, I, my hat's off to a man named Arthur Custance, who was an anthropologist who died years ago. Uh, but names change, and we already hit on that earlier, which was fantastic. Thank you for that. We already hit on it earlier. Names change, and let's look at a, a, a particular example of how Alexander the Great became Iskandar al Akbar. Okay? There's Alexander, and, and um, this is kind of what we might have in mind when you see this name, right? Okay, so uh, the Greek version of Alexander is Alexandros, okay? And then the Arabic version is Iskandar. But we see that the A and the L just disappear, okay, from, from the Greek. It disappears. The X from the Greek turns into an is, right? The X turns into an isk. I guess the uh, Arabs didn't like the They like the sk, okay? The Andros uh, becomes Andar, which is pretty close. But the Greeks get very nervous if the name just ends without an OS. Am I right, Dylan? I mean, how many Greek names have to end in OS, and so, so they just drop it. They drop the OS. And anyway, all right. Dylan. No more memes. I thought it was funny. No, not one. Bunt cake. Bunt, bunt, Because Greeks don't like words. If it was buntas, if it was a buntas cake, then she would have been fine. Or maybe she was more like a, uh, It's the uh, too. The uh. Yeah. I don't like the uh. So let's take this and apply it to our R, okay? 
Remember that these cities uh, are in three different countries, and they all have the same name. And of course, Hebrews are writing it in their language. And we know that Aram is also called Syria, right? Uh, and that's, but that's from different cultures. So consider some similarities in these cities slash districts slash uh, governance slash regional names in Aram that are near Israel and Damascus. <coughs> See if you hear anything similar. Ara, Aram, Dara, Aram, Ara. Does it sound similar? Is this far fetched? <laughs> no, no, it's it's absolutely not. You you see this throughout history. Like, uh, go and find uh, you know Ashkenaz, one of the sons of uh, Japheth, Ashkenaz. You go and you find his name all over the map in Armenia and Turkey, Askani, Iskak, all sorts of different derivations of it. It's these things that are named after somebody important. So I'm putting forth, and I'm not the only one that thinks this way, I'm putting forth the idea that it is referring to something because the context is referring to Aram. So it probably is referring to something to do with Aram. And these cities are similarly named, even though it, it may look odd to you the first time, but you know, bear in mind, Alexander became Iskandar. And, and that doesn't really sound like someone... But these, these names are existent even today. Some of these back then were existent in Aram. And even today, some of these names are existing in Aram. So uh, it's, it's another possibility. So, but my take is this. Bottom line, it has something to do with Aram. I don't think it has to do with the city in Moab, or the city in Gad, Reuben, Amman, or the city in Judah. It has something to do specifically with Damascus. And it's, uh, people from other cultures say things differently. If you keep it in mind that it may very well be this, because these are all areas that are right there on their southern border, which is right there with Israel. And it's a very fertile area. So there were a lot of cities there. To this day, it's very fertile. Okay. So it has something to do with it. Okay, and, and then uh, finally, uh, Tiglath Pileser. It's not just Damascus. Tiglath Pileser III actually wrote down in his annals, you can go and look this up, he, he wrote, personally, I destroyed 591 cities from the 16 districts of Damascus, like the ruins from the flood. Listen, Tiggy, in today's age, we don't believe in the flood, so... He sure did back then, and he liked to use that imagery to show the devastation that he wreaked on uh, Aram. So, in modern Syria is broken into 14 districts, so long as ISIS is okay with that for now. Uh, so basically, the cities of Aror are, they, they flee from there. They're not inhabited. And it's great pasture land. So for a time, and even that it didn't say forever. We only get the forever from the Septuagint. But we see, this is the 734 or 732 destruction of the Arameans by the Assyrians. And then the Israelites got it 10 years later in 722. Okay. Uh, verse 3 again. I told you. I'll tell you. All right, 17, verse 3. The fortified city will disappear from Ephraim and sovereignty from Damascus and the remnant of Aram they will be like the glory of the sons of Israel. All right, so uh, here we see again, Ephraim is being used to, it's a one tribe in Israel, it's being used to talk about all of Israel, because they're the, the most prominent. And uh, Israel was trusting, not in God, they were trusting in the Arameans. They were trusting in the Arameans to counterbalance against the Assyrians. They were trusting in the combined might of the Arameans to fight and plunder. Judah, okay, in the south. So they were going to make a name for themselves. And if they can conquer Judah, then they got three territories. Because the Assyrians are, they mean business. They're coming. Okay, so it says here specifically that the sovereignty departs from Damascus, and that happens. In 732, Assyria takes it over. And Assyria devastates their towns. Uh, and then look, the remnant of the Arameans. 
are like in the remnant. These are the ones that are left. They're like the glory of the sons of Israel. Uh, tell me about the glory of the sons of Israel. Give me a smile. It says in the next verse. Oh, come on! <laughs> You're right. It does. It says in the very next verse. So let's read uh, verses 4 through 11 and find out about the glory of Israel. The verse right after saying that they will be like the glory of Israel. Verses 4 through 11. Now in that day, the glory of Jacob will fade. And Jacob is Israel. The glory of Jacob will fade, and the fatness of his flesh will become lean. It will be even like the reaper gathering the standing grain as his arm harvests the ears. It gets tough and strong, right? You want to lose the underarm fat, you got to harvest grain. All right. Uh, or it will be like one gleaning ears of grain in the valley of Raphaim. Yet gleanings will be left in it like the shaking of an olive tree. Two or three olives on the topmost bough, four or five on the branches of the fruitful trees, declares the Lord, the God of Israel. In that day, man will have regard for his maker, and his eyes will look to the Holy One of Israel. He will not have regard for the altars, the work of his hands, nor will he have, nor will he look to that which his fingers have made, even the asharim and incense stands. In that day, their strong cities will be like forsaken places in the forest, or like branches which they abandoned before the sons of Israel, and the land of, uh, and the land will be a desolation. For you have forgotten the God of your salvation, and have not remembered the rock of your refuge. Therefore, you plant delightful plants and set them with vine slips of a strange god. <clears throat> in the day that you plant it, you carefully fence it in, and in the morning you bring your seed to blossom. But the harvest will be a heap in a day of sickliness and incurable pain. This is the doom of the northern kingdom Israel. Right? You saw a lot of imagery in there. Their glory is from fatness to leanness. Fatness is really good back then. You want to be well fed. But when, when you're reaping the harvest, and you go to an olive tree, and you get five olives, that's not enough. How long is five olives going to sustain you? I hope you have millions of trees. Right? Uh, so... It says, in that day, in that day that Aram has been brought low, and there's only a remnant, in that day Israel will also be brought low, and they will be destroyed. Um, and, and yeah, that's, that's Aram's remnant, is, is just like the glory of the sons of Israel, which is faded glory. Alright? Uh, so, fatness to leanness, it's a picture of post-judgment in Israel with only a few righteous fruits left that look toward God. Uh, verse 10, those that are judged are like what we see in verse 10, and those, uh, for they left their God for fake gods, and they reap verse 11. So verse 10 says, For you have forgotten the God of your salvation, and have not remembered the rock of your refuge. Therefore you plant delightful plants, they follow other gods, they, delight, uh, they plant delightful plants, and set them with vine slips of a strange God. In the day that you plant it, you carefully fence it in. Boy, they take care of their fake gods. And in the morning you bring your seed to blossom. But the harvest will be a heap in a day of sickliness and incurable pain. Suffering for Israel. For what they did. And, and, and what, what did they do? We see Damascus is suffering. Aram is suffering. And Israel is suffering. And God said in chapter 7, that's exactly what would happen. Alright, right, let's read uh, 17, 12 through 14. So you guys got a test. You're going to have to take a test. Alas, the uproar of many peoples who roar like the roaring of the seas, and the rumbling of nations who rush on like the rumbling of mighty waters. The nations rumble on like the rumbling of many waters, but he will rebuke them and they will flee far away and be chased like chaff in the mountains before the wind or like whirling dust before a gale. At evening time, behold, there is terror. Before morning, they are no more. 
Such will be the portion of those who plunder us and the lot of those who pillage us. Okay? Us is important. What's the picture we see here of nations who pillage and plunder the us? What do they get? Destroyed. You are destroyed. Yes, <laughs> they get destroyed. Uh, so the us in verse 14 uh, refers specifically to Judah. This is where Isaiah is at. This is where his ministry is. He's the one that's having to deal with Israel and Aram invading them. And then he has to deal with Assyria invading them after that. And so the context is a reference to all three of these nations because Israel, Aram, and Assyria all fall. And the, the cool thing is, this uh, in verse 14, At evening time, behold, there is terror. Before morning, they are no more. If you recall, I had uh, several weeks ago talked about when uh, the armies of Sennacherib, who had devastated Judah many years later, Outside the gates of Jerusalem, 185,000 die in one night by plague. This is attested to by Josephus and Barosus the Chaldean. And it's, uh, of course, also in the Bible. And Herodotus even talks about it. Because while, uh, uh, while Sennacherib's general is getting devastated in Jerusalem, Sennacherib himself is getting devastated down in Egypt by the Egyptians and the Ethiopians. And the mice. Remember the, the, the mouse I put up there with this? Because the mice ate all their bow strings and ate all their shield straps. Hard to fight with bow strings and shield straps. But if the shield strap's gone, you can definitely play disc golf with the shields. Again, that's probably where it was invented. So they had to throw something at them while they fled. All right, but uh, the 185,000 soldiers was an overnight event. And this verse is talking about destroyed and overnight, but it could also be hyperbole for just the, just the general destruction of any nation that comes against Israel. And remember what it says in Genesis 12, 3. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. Okay. All right, uh, now it's time for your test. Your test is to spend 2 minutes and 35 seconds with Hal. Hal Lindsay is going to give you my entire class today in 2 minutes and 35 seconds. Now let me say this about Hal Lindsay. I read The Late Great Planet Earth. He has a lot of good ideas in there. A lot of speculation. That's all it can be because he likes to write about end times and that sort of thing. I love end times. I love studying it and I like hearing people's ideas. Um, so I, I like Hal Lindsay. Please don't get me wrong. But for what he's about to do, you are going to be tested with these questions. <laughs> so I'm going to start the video. Hi, Mom. Okay. <coughs> really? Uh, yeah, you can cut the light. That's good. Here we go. Yesterday's prophecies, today's headlines. This is the Hal Lindsey Report. As I have noted before, the city of Damascus remains the oldest continuously inhabited city on the face of the earth. In all its long history, it has never been totally destroyed. Yet Isaiah predicts that in the last days, Damascus will be totally annihilated in a matter of moments. Okay. Where does it say that Isaiah 17 is the last days? Did anybody see in there where it said Isaiah 17 is the last days? And where does it say in Isaiah 17 that Damascus will be totally annihilated in a matter of moments? Okay, just checking. Come on, baby. Oh, I, I didn't mean to offend you. Please. He wrote, okay. The burden of Damascus. Behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city 
and it shall be a ruinous heap. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, can Damascus be destroyed and then be rebuilt? Yes. yes. Okay. <clears throat> and in that day, it shall come to pass that the glory of Jacob shall be made thin, and the fatness of his flesh shall wax lean. Okay. Um, where does it say in the King James Version, the translation he's using, that Damascus will be destroyed forever? They use the word cities of Aror, Arar. Okay. So the question is, where does it say that Damascus will be destroyed forever? In the King James Version that he's using, the answer is, it doesn't. It doesn't. Okay, and then here's the question. Why did you skip verses 2 and 3? You went from verse 1 to verse 4 and jumped straight to 4. That is where we see Israel and Aram are united. Are Syria and Israel united now? Isaiah's depiction of Damascus troubling Israel in the last days comes as at a time when the glory of Jacob, or Israel, is made very thin. My dear. Um, so where is Isaiah depicting Damascus as troubling Israel in the last days in Isaiah 17? It doesn't. <clears throat> Criminy. Speaking in the same terms as this prophecy, if Israel's glory were any thinner, to be transparent, the only condition under which Israel could survive the world's outrage at hitting Syria with a nuclear attack would be if Syria hit Israel first with weapons of mass destruction, such as biological, chemical, or nuclear weapons. Okay, sir. Wow. Um, how is a weapons of mass destruction strike depicted in Isaiah 17.4? What, when was he? When was the date on that? 2013. <clears throat> what is this? I know. I'm sure it's on TBN or something. Was this his research and writing, or was it somebody else's that he just had? Typed? Oh, I was. Great question, Chris. I was wondering the same thing, to be quite honest. That is exactly the kind of circumstances predicted in Isaiah chapter 17, verse 4. Well, I meant to. I meant to stop it there because he says that's exactly what is predicted: a nuclear biological or chemical strike on Israel by Damascus in Isaiah 17.4. As I noted earlier, Syria has long-range missiles already armed with both chemical and biological warheads aimed straight at Israel. This ISIS report indicates that Assad either has or is developing nuclear warheads for use against Israel as well. Isaiah makes a further prediction about the terrible incident. And behold, at eventide, trouble, and before the morning, he, meaning Damascus, is no more. Wow. So why did you jump from verse 4 to 14 and then apply it solely to Damascus when verse 12 and 13 apply it to nations and not nations? It says, and not Damascus. Why, why did you do that? Or why did? Why do you think he? He has an agenda. Mm -hmm. He has an agenda. This is the portion of them that spoil us, and the lot of them that rob us. Many experts believe Israel has more than two hundred <laughs> nuclear weapons that could fulfill Isaiah's prophecy in about sixty seconds. The potential of a nuclear-armed Syria pulls Isaiah's prophecy right out of the Bible and plants it on the front pages of the daily newspapers. In the book... How is his presentation similar to my presentation? No research at all. <laughs> all right, Marianne, thank you for all your hard work. <laughs> she slayed, and hey, Chris, you nailed us. Uh, <laughs> you quoted the Bible. 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> he, he did. He quoted the Bible. Similar dramatic pauses. I have dramatic pauses. He backed up what he said. With? With the Bible, but it was just out of context. It's ah, the thing we've been talking about. It's out of context, but he built, he built a, a parallel the context things. around it. He did. And he did a good job. He did a bad job. Yeah. He, did, he did a good job. Of, is, is he the one where that comic strip came from? Yeah, right. <laughs> no. Well, I don't know, actually. How Lindsay uh, wrote Lake Great Planet Earth the year I was born. Well, he's very persuasive of what he says. Oh, yeah. He makes you believe what it actually is, unless you dive into it. If you don't know your Bible. Yeah. yeah. If you haven't read, if you don't read, if you don't just look at it, and you listen to that. Well, and even if I went to go and read my Bible after that to say, does it really say that, I would probably think it was just something I was missing. If I tried to read this on my own, because yes. it all kind of blurs together after a while if you don't pick it apart with someone who knows. Could you imagine fighting? I mean, I get it. could you see getting into an argument with another Christian? Who's, You've got to believe Isaiah 17 is going to be fulfilled soon. You could get into an argument with somebody about that. And are you going to convince them otherwise? Remember 2 Peter 3? In the last days, in the end times, the mockers will come with their mocking. And they will follow after their own lusts and say, Where is this coming that we've been promised? Ever since our fathers died, life goes on. So this just becomes, oh, and the horror that I felt when I went through. I mean, you just have fun. Go to uh, YouTube and type in Isaiah 17. Mm. You will in, in Isaiah 18, for that matter. Because we'll be hitting the same sort of thing next week. Um, oh, and then the sad thing is that this was his chapter. Verse 1, verse 4, mm -hmm. and verse 14. Uh, but my parachute is this. Because... Golly, I, I hate to be holding too tightly because I'm willing to concede that I'm wrong and that Hal is right. If these things do come to pass, I was wrong. Dylan and I have talked about this issue. We don't care about Dylan and Jeremy being right. We care about being right. Period. And you should as well. And you can't trust everything you see even when the production's good even when it's pulling at your heartstrings. Because this is ISIS we're talking about. Actually, it wasn't really ISIS back in his day. Yes, okay. <laughs> uh, but here's our duty. Okay, here's your duty. Don't forget to love the Lord with our minds so that we don't fall victim to bad doctrine, right? Don't forget to love the Lord with our hearts so that we neglect to share the gospel with the lost. Thank you for that sermon today, Pastor. Don't forget to love the Lord with our souls. And may our love for Him define who we are, our psyche. And don't forget to love the Lord with our strength so that we can go and, and be doers of God's work. Any questions? All right. Let's pray. Father, I... Thank you for this time in your word. I meant absolutely no disrespect to Hal Lindsey and what he said. I just think he was wrong as my brother in Christ. Father, I pray that people would take your word more seriously and spend the time that they should in order to get to the truth. And then if there's some sort of disagreement, Lord, that we can shake hands and say, you know what, we'll see. So, but we should all be careful, especially about future things, Lord. We don't want to contribute to the mocking that is to come and that already is partially here. Father, help us to go and to love you with our hearts and love you with our minds and our soul and our strength. Help us to encourage one another throughout this week. And be with us now as we pray for each other. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.